Oh, this is why I heard this story. Because in Oregon, you are responsible personally if you serve someone and they do stupid things. And it shut down a bar. Oh. Because the guy left the bar drunk. Yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't know if that's a good blanket policy to have. Because <laughs> by mean, that rationale, someone... I could get it in my head to do something after it, and then just go have a couple beers and then leave and then do it and say, "Oh, it's his fault." Well, like the only time I've ever had any problems with people I've served is because those fuckers I served them one drink or well less, and they were like drinking in their cars or taking pills or like something that was completely out of my control. Yeah. Yeah, there was a Coke shortage like a year ago, so everyone was getting drunk real quick at the bars. <laughs> yeah, because the main dealer got busted. Uh, I mean, we could have got them some meth and some baby laxatives. Cocaine's not delicious. Never try it. <laughs> I'm a mother now. I've never done drugs. It's called plausible deniability, and it's important. <laughs> It's like a drink with death. Yay, my drink. Woo! The wooing was from the bubble. It just happens now. <laughs> so today we're talking about clock blockers. I'm Nick McDonald. Oh, yeah. I'm Kate McDonald. <laughs> and today we're talking about clock blockers. I clock blocked myself on that. Like, I'm like, mm, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Straight to cock blocking. Which you, you, no get one excited, likes you get excited to talk about cock blocking, just I understand. You've all been there. I mean, although sometimes I find it fun to cock block, I've never had fun being cock blocked. No, no. Well, it's one of those things that nobody wants happening to them, but they don't mind doing to someone else. You know? Yeah. I wish I had a funny tagline for that, but I can't think of anything like that. Well, I was, I was trying to think of something to compare it to, and I was like, I was thinking maybe like IVs. <laughs> no one wants it done to themselves, but. You want to stick a needle in someone else's arm? Let's do it. I was trying to come up with something along those lines, but mine all went really darker, so uh, it was probably, I just figured it would be best if I kept my mouth shut. In this like drinking with corpses? No, there was some Holocaust stuff bouncing around in my head that didn't belong there, so. Oh, I, yeah, let's not Holocaust. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's wait till Trump is out of office for Holocaust jokes. Until <laughs> so we know there's not a civil war. No. And uh, we have. A drink to go with our cock blockers that is the uh, Salty Bill's, no wait. Salty Bill's Limp Richard. Salty Bill's Limp Richard, I was halfway there, that's correct. You should know, you invented it. You're going down a luge, what? I said you should know, you invented it. Yeah, but I don't pay a lot of attention to the things I do. Yeah, but you understood, you, you remembered it better than I did. I was going to have to try to find my phone. It's like- and- Look it up. Kelly Kapoor once said she talks a lot, so she just kind of tunes herself out. <laughs> I get that. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So what do you think? Should we have one of these cock-blocking ghosts? Yeah, I'll give me one of those. I'll give you... Well, you kind of know the bandage man to a degree, right? Do you know the bandage man? Bandage mm-hmm. man? Bandage man? Do you know the bandage man? He lives at Cannon Beach. <laughs> So he was, is real stinky rot, stinky rot, stinking rot. He is full of stinking rot. He lives at Cannon Beach. Okay, so then instead I will will come back around to the bandage man and I will talk about uh, the ghost of the Goose River Bridge. Goose River is today known as Rockport, Maine, and it was the home during the Revolutionary War to William Richardson. During the war, men of fit fighting age were called off to the front lines, so small outlying communities like Goose River were left to care, left to the care of women, children, the infirmed, and the elderly. As such, Goose River was often hounded by redcoats looking to break support for the revolutionaries by harassing locals and raiding homes for supply. Rather than breaking these locals, though, they just inspired them to look for ways to cock things up for the annoying Brits wherever they could. They would hide in the tree lines and take pot shots at redcoat landing partings rowing to shore from their ships. A couple older men wreaked havoc by just sitting in earshot of the Brits, and one would play roll call on his drum while the other yelled out military commands, giving the impression of regiments of patriots nearby, just out of sight. But uh, William Richardson would go down in local history for his actions to befuddle the Redcoats. 
Befuddle. Befuddle. Samuel Tucker was a privateer working for the Americans, and he stole a shipment of tea from a British vessel and was being pursued by an Imperial warship. Using his fishing boat and intimate knowledge of the local waterways, William Richardson came to Tucker's aid, helping him navigate the hazardous Maine coastland and guiding him to a hiding spot near Harpswell. Harpswell is in a channel in the middle of the... Oh, God, I should have practiced this beforehand. Sebaskadegan Island? Sebaskadegan Island. Does that sound likely? Sebaskadegan! Sebaskadegan Island. An area with a lot of rocky, irregular channels throughout. Uh, the Brits knew their warship couldn't pursue through the treacherous waters. This And I looked this area up on a map. It's kind of an interesting area. It's just full of, like, inlets and passages and little rocky islands. And it's really rough to navigate. So the Brits knew they couldn't get in, so they set up a blockade on the outside, waiting for Tucker and Richardson when they would inevitably have to come out of hiding and flee to safety. Tucker panicked because he knew he was trapped, but Richardson, knowing the seas like the back of his hand, he convinced him, you know, we just sit tight here, we buckle down, and we'll wait for the next storm. Sure enough, a storm rolled in, and the squall distracted the Brits. So he and Tucker snuck past the blockade during the storm, and by the time the Brits realized what happened, Tucker was well on his way to the safety of Boston Harbor. When the war ended in 1783, all of Goose River celebrated, and, and none more than William Richardson. Threw a large party at his home, but that wasn't enough for him. So he set out with a pitcher of ale and roamed the town, knocking on doors, greeting people in the streets, and trying to rally more partygoers for his celebration. I'm not going to pretend I've never done this. Oh, no. This guy's this guy's an American hero in so many ways. <laughs> While crossing the Goose River Bridge, Richardson ran across three men and approached them to join the festivities like he had everyone else. Unbeknownst to him, though, these three were Tories, still loyal to the British crown. One clubbed him on the head, and they left him unconscious on the bridge where he succumbed to his injuries and died before somebody else found him. Ever since then, this bridge and its different incarnations, the original bridge, bridge is gone, but they've had, you know, two or three other bridges in this area to take its place. But the different, the bridge and its incarnations have been haunted by Richardson, and he's often seen staggering around in the woods, pitcher in hand, looking for more party goers, and they simply call him the Pitcher Man. So the biggest um, run on Pitcher Man sightings comes from the 1950s, when the area became popular as a lover lane spot for hot and bothered teens to park their car and get risky where they wouldn't be bothered. So they were all the more surprised to see a man in revolutionary era garb stumbling out of the woods, pitcher in hand, and tapping on the car window looking to share a drink with him. <laughs> Uh, reports of the pitcher man because such an issue that a sign was posted reading no trespassing between sunset and sunrise i mean i feel like i've been out drinking with this guy before <laughs> one of my favorites he's an american hero and he's a party fiend so what more could yeah. you possibly want out of a ghost right exactly like i i see no issues here <laughs> minus if you're the one he's cock blocking, but he just wants to have a drink with you. He right? just, you know, I see no he problem. doesn't mean any harm by. It. Sounds like a winning scenario. You're right. He's a he's a gentleman and a scholar. All right. Well, we got one cock blocking ghost out of the way. Should we move on to another one? My child cock blocks a lot too. Well, that's their job. That's their primary job. It was not the one I was thinking of. Well, then I should probably uh, move on to the next cock blocking ghost which is the Cannon Beach Bandage Man from our home state of Oregon. Hooray! At least you said it right. I didn't say Oregon. Or Ori Oregon. Oregon. This is just so, a, a note to anyone who's listening. If you say Oregon, then nobody from Oregon will ever want to have anything to do with you. You are instant persona non grata. So the convenient part of living in southern Oregon, so we're like epicenter of the green rush with the legalized weed and everything so there's all sorts of different people that live here now mm -hmm. if they don't know how to say oregon you say okay but if you see the guys with the stickers with the guns on it and they say or a gun with the g-u-n and then that makes sense to all of them they all get it out yeah <laughs> Well, the bandage man of Cannon Beach, Oregon. Not Amsterdam. 
No, not that. Not the bandage man of Amsterdam or the hamster man of Amsterdam. Hamster man of Amsterdam. Uh, the Bandage Man has harassed the people of Cannon Beach, Oregon for decades. His primary run of activity was through the 50s and 60s, uh, and he's been known to haunt the local roads, forests, and occasionally even the bars, which is just our kind of ghost, I suppose. I mean, I've heard of the uh, Bandage Man, but I did not know he went in the bars, and now I... I'm even more excited. <laughs> so Highway 101, just north of Cannon Beach, it used to have a stretch with a really sharp corner on it, and they've uh, they've taken that corner out. They rerouted the road and straightened it out. Uh, but if you are not a West Coaster, just disclaimer: Highway 101 runs up and down the coast, and um, if you have any sort of car sickness. Do not recommend. No, but if you want a really beautiful drive and you are not in a hurry to go anywhere, taking 101 up the West Coast is uh, kind of the way to go. Amazing, yeah. Definitely a win, but Mm -hmm. very, very windy. Yeah. I used to lay (laughs) under bus seats for high school sports games, so I wouldn't get car (laughs) sick. Well, this tiny, tiny, tiny segment has been straightened out more than it was. I'm sure it's probably still windy as all hell. There, the old stretch still kind of remains, and it's been nicknamed Bandage Man Road by the locals. And driving it at night has become something of a rite of passage for the local teens when they get their driver's license. The Bandage Man himself lurks cannon beaches, forests, and roads, and he's pretty much just your stereotypical universal movie mummy. He's covered in bandages and smells of rotten flesh. People seem to see him more on nights of heavy lightning. Most legends place the uh, Bandage Man's origin back to the 1950s. Some go far back as the 30s, though. The mostly agreed-upon story is that he was a logger. Sometimes it's an electrician or another tradesman, generally a logger, because Oregon, who had a on-the-job accident and got chopped up, in quotation marks. He was bandaged up and placed in an ambulance, but the ambulance got caught in a landslide along the highway, and by the time the rescue crews got to the ambulance, the engine man had disappeared. That's a bad day. <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, this is the cock-blocking ghost episodes, and the bandage man is no exception. His favorite pastime appears to be harassing teens in vehicles. Uh, one tale involves a pair of teens parked on the side of the road in a pickup truck for a little canoodling. Suddenly, they feel the truck dip to one side, like somebody was climbing into the bed, and then the whole truck begins to shake violently, so the teens look back, and they see the bandage man in the bed of the pickup truck, rocking it back and forth and pounding on the cab. Naturally, they start the truck and start to drive away, and by the time they got to town, the bandage man had disappeared. I mean, he's just pounding, he's just trying to help you find a rhythm. (laughs) The rhythm method, that's how, uh... That's how that works, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's how I got pregnant. I didn't have a ghost pounding on a car. (laughs) You know, it's like having the, uh, what do you call that? The guy who calls the stroke on a rowing team, you know? Calling the stroke. There's a name for it that I don't know because I don't have money. So it's an actual job with a title. Anyway, Bandage Man's pattern is fairly consistent. He finds teens parked in the, on the road and scares them, or sometimes he'll jump in the back of a truck or convertible and disappear before they reach town. Sometimes he'll leave behind smatterings of smelly bandages or rotten meat. Um, the one tale about a bar... Is he, wait, are that, these physical bandages or just the smell of the rotten meat? Um, Both. I've, I've seen... Because I've heard of the smell, but like I... I and mean, I haven't researched. Well, I've heard of the yeah, smell, but from like... from the stories I researched, sometimes he leaves behind chunks of bandages or flesh too. Like that's that's gooey. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the the tale about a bar I I mentioned earlier is uh, there's one port that he smashed the window to Bill's Tavern and Grill House in Cannon Beach and and stole someone's dog to eat the poor creature. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting my shotgun, I'm loading shells with salt, and you're not eating my dog. You know, there's 
This is one of those uh, stories that there's been occasional cases of teens admitting or getting caught dressing up as the bandage man. So it's it's one of those where it's kind of hard to tell where the local legend ends and the local prank begins. Teens or us drunk on family vacation? Can we make this happen? It sounds like good old-fashioned Oregon hijinks is what it sounds like. Do you want to talk about Tom? Yeah. Give me another one of them cock blocking ghosts. Not Tom from MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> he was a good guy. He still has a skin, I think. Skin Tom. Skin Tom. There is a song. Oh. I'm gonna, I should see if I can find it. Yeah. So this is apparently a common southern urban legend based in Tennessee, but it does appear it has also made some appearances in like Kentucky and places. So. I don't know how much validity there is to this story, but it's interesting, and it's another cock blocker. So, story has it, there was a gentleman named Tom, hence Ken Tom. Yeah, I know. Uh, and best I can pinpoint, he's from Wallen, Tennessee, which I have not verified as a real place, so I apologize if it's not, if anyone from Tennessee is listening to this. <laughs> but Tom was a ladies' man. He went over pretty much every girl in town, biblically. And then he started going to other towns to meet more girls. In one of the adjoining towns, he found a lady named Eleanor. And they began seeing each other in secret, getting frisky on the back road on Lover's Lane. But apparently Eleanor was married. And there's two versions of the story where it appears, well, there's more than two versions of the story. But it appears in some versions he knew she was married, in some versions he did not. But Eleanor's husband found out. Nonetheless, showed up while they were making whoopee, or at least necking, in a car on Lover's Lane. And Eleanor's husband skinned Tom alive with a hunting knife. That's not a small task, skinning someone alive. It's not. I mean, I don't think he lived through it, but they started skinning him while he was alive. Some versions of the stories, he stabbed Eleanor in the stomach as well. So the story now says that Skin Tom hangs out on this lover's lane, waiting for people to go park, as it would be. And then he comes at them with his hunting knife to teach them a lesson. So in my opinion, it would be more that he didn't know that she was married, because real weird karma if you knew. (laughs) But let me see. The lyrics to the Skin Tom song are, Have you seen the ghost of Skin Tom? Bloody red bones with the skin all gone. Oh, 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 oh. Wouldn't it be chilly with no skin on? <laughs> I'm sure it is exactly to that tune. I see, it probably only took one person to write that. It takes like eight people to write a Beyonce song. So. It's true. It has that he is a skinless, bloody skeleton, but he has clothes on, so I don't know how that works. Well, I was going to ask because it's kind of a hassle to carry around a hunting knife if you fuck naked and have no skin. Yeah, so he's dressed in 1920s attire, carrying the knife he was skinned with, and yeah. I don't know how he just put his clothes back on afterwards, I guess. I'm going to uh, see if I can find the Skin Tom song real quick. <laughs> skin Tom song. Well, here's a guy singing it to us. So this does seem more urban legend than actual haunt, but we won't, you know, talk about that. You know what we we got three cock walking ghosts without having to resort to the hook on the handle, so I think we're doing Oh, okay. yeah, that's true. Um, okay, I've got I've got a YouTube ghost Tom here. Why did this bring up Freebird? Who? Hmm? It brought up Freebird? I lost the song. I lost the song. <laughs> did you request? Yeah, Skin Tom. Okay, anyway, here's Freebird. <laughs> totally plausible in my life. <laughs> Alright, you load. Skin Tom doing Wonderwall. Hit it. After all, you're my skin, Tom. <laughs> I just tried to email this to Hillary for whatever reason instead of myself. You need an adult? <laughs> She's just gonna be like, what the fuck is this? Okay, I got the Skin Tom song. Let me see your Tom to Tom Tom Tom. <laughs> And I looked for it online, and because the only video really I could find of it were some teenage girls singing it, I thought that I would cover it. This is 11 years old. It is. (laughs) 
doing a ukulele cover, by the way. Have you seen the ghost of Tom? Long white bones with a skin all gone. Poor old Tom. Wouldn't it be chilly with no skin on? And that's it. He put a lot of effort into that. He really did. Yeah. I think the Lizzie Borden song is longer, but to be fair, she's more well known. Well, should we talk about these drink recipes? Yeah. What did we decide for Salty Bill or. Fast Chocolate Salty Balls? Hey, everybody, have you seen Bill? So, Salty. Salty Bill's Limp Richard. That's what I was seeing. Salty Bill's Limp Richard. Salty Tom's Limp, limp Richard. Salty Bill, not Salty Tom. Skin Tom. Skin Tom, Salty Rick. Don't salt You know what? If these guy. guys had more creative fucking names. A long time ago, they didn't have Spider Man, then Superman, or whatever. Pilot Inspector Richardson. <laughs> so, you know, we've got these ghosts that are cock blocking. It seems primarily teenagers. Funny that. Like, a I mean, cock blocking teenagers. Grown ups usually have sex in their houses, let's be honest here. That is fair. Well, I mean, dogging is popular in the UK, so. What is? Dogging. Is that what they call it? I believe they call it dogging, where they purposefully go out and have sex in a car, like with the intent of, like, letting people catch them and watch them. Oh. And, like, for some people, the thrill is getting caught, and for some people, the thrill is catching them. Okay. I was not aware of this. Oh, yeah, that's a thing. It's a thing. So romantic. Yeah, well. <laughs> okay. So, teenagers, drink beer, because it's easier to access. Well, I mean, when I was a teenager, I drank a lot of bottles of peach schnapp, magic purple punch, but... Let's be fair, most teenagers... Well, I don't, you know, I don't know about the Gen Z's. The Gen Z's, I haven't got a good... They're drinking, kind of... like, Henny and popping Xanax. I yeah. don't know how this is happening. It's not like the millennials, where they mostly avoided being rap scallions, for the most part. And then there was our generation where we would just drink in class. <laughs> I only, I wasn't usually in class. It was like, I would do it in the common areas, not in class. That's just disrespectful. We drank in the halls, we drank in class, we drank in the parking lot. We... Yeah. <laughs> and we drank whatever we could get our hands on. Like a suicide made out of your parents' liquor cabinet. Well, that was it, yeah. You weren't particularly picky. Sometimes you had a good score, but <laughs> generally it was any port in a storm. Or any mad dog in a storm if you didn't have access to port. Yeah. Anyway, when we were teenagers, mostly people drank beer. Yeah. That was the easier stuff to get. So, we just, I decided, we decided to go with a beer-based cocktail. And this ghost is cock-blocking, so let's throw in some whiskey, just for the illusion of whiskey dick. Whether or not you get it, that's up to you. The advantage here, though, is if there is whiskey and you're having performance issues, you have an out. That's the important Ah, part. yeah. So, if you're having some, some issues with your little soldier, just drink some whiskey, then you can blame that. <laughs> so, I love beer, but over the last few years, I've developed a pretty major allergy to beer. So, I did not get to drink a cold one of these. Did Sean road test it for you? Sean assisted with the road testing, yes. John assists with the road testing of as many of the drinks as he can. Anyway, my thought behind this was, I feel like this could be done well as, like, an Irish coffee, but, like, a cold brew. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, is a is a hard challenge. Like, a beer-based cocktail with whiskey in it, that's not a boiler maker. That's just, like, what the hell's going on here? So, I tried this. You can do it with regular whiskey. I'm not a big fan of flavored whiskeys, but I did get, partially because it was on sale, a pecan whiskey mm -hmm. and so i did like an ounce and a half of pecan whiskey topped with guinness because Always that is a breakfast color. beer mm -hmm. so this is basically a breakfast drink all right cool and then i made a salted whipped topping to layer nicely on top nice and frothy problem is there is a potential for curdling mm -hmm. with milk and whiskey in the same cocktail yeah so there's two ways I would suggest going about consuming this drink. When you ice it, which it does feel inorganic to ice your beer, <laughs> but it worked in this scenario. The other would be to just pound it like an Irish car bomb 
I've also had a like sour apple liqueur with caramel cream shots, and those you have to count before you the kernel. Too. Right, it, like this didn't curdle excessively, so like I don't think most people. I like I don't think it's gonna deter most people from drinking it. Sean is a like he doesn't eat cottage cheese or mayonnaise, or so he had a hard time like after it sat for a minute. Mm-hmm. So it just is kind of you know it's up to you. And the fuller fat you use in the cream topping. If you get, like, the heavy whipping cream instead of... Heavy whipping cream is going to work better. You could very easily make this whipped topping with 2% milk. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going for actual whipped cream. You're going for just, like, a foam. But you do risk faster curdling. You risk faster curdling. So if you do that, if you're dieting... (laughs) And trying to watch the fat content, then you just need to drink this drink quickly. <laughs> but I have, uh, I've emailed Starbucks, so I anticipate this on their cold brew menu immediately. <laughs> You're just giving it away to Starbucks. I agree. Because, you know, a drive through booze is the way to go. There's places, I think a lot more places have been doing that since uh, COVID, I hear. Well, I know in some states, I believe it was Alabama, it used to be like the, the dive, drive through bakery stands. They couldn't give you a straw. That's how they kept the open container laws. Mm. Like now, straws are illegal in a lot of places. So yeah, like especially in Oregon, where you need to just do your cocaine with some sort of cash denomination. <laughs> I feel like it's trashy to do it with a dollar bill. If you are doing your cocaine with anything smaller than a fifty, you really need to assess your life choices. <laughs> Look at your parents' Bible. They probably have a fifty or two hidden in there. You just shake it out, and then you can smoke your cocaine. What has happened to this podcast? <laughs> I've got all the tips. I told you, I'm here to educate the people. <laughs> I, I got all the facts. <laughs> what do you want to know about? I got facts. <laughs> We're going to add that as a Patreon level. <laughs> you have questions. Kate has answers. We can do a Patreon level of Ask Kate, where you ask any question and Kate comes through with an answer. It might not be a good answer. It might not be a related answer. But I will give you an answer. (laughs) I'm a problem solver. What can I say? (laughs) So is there anything else you need to say about this recipe? I mean, you you wouldn't have to use Guinness, obviously. You can use another dark beer. I think a stout's going to work best. But for high school sakes, I like a Guinness. Sorry, I, my brain shut down. I was just trying to think of like, because we were just talking about how in high school you drink what's available. I was just trying to come to high school and drinking what's available, have access to a uh, dark beer. Well, I mean, when we were in high school, our parents were home brewing all the time, so we had access to good beer. That's, uh, yeah, that's true, but that's. Hence, as an adult, I'm a beer snob. I feel like those facts are related. <laughs> Part of how I was drinking in the hall was that I had, I had our quote unquote root beer. That somehow ended up alcoholic despite our best efforts. I don't know if those were our best efforts or if we just happened to make boozy root beer. Nobody questioned me. I got in trouble for panhandling for beer money, but I never got in trouble for wandering the halls with a beer bottle. I remember going to a economics class with Purple Flaming Jesus, which was some concoction based on a great mad dog. <laughs> It was called the Purple Flaming Jesus, because every time you took a drink, you couldn't help but go, Jesus Christ! That's right. <laughs> I mean, I am not a classy broad. I once drank a bottle of sweet vermouth in a parking lot, because that is what we had before a concert, before I was old enough to buy alcohol. <laughs> Brian got mad at me one time, because I decided to go into class while he was still in the car drinking before school. He said, you're making me drink by myself, that makes me an alcoholic. <laughs> That's the joy of seeing dead people. You never have to drink alone. Or having a cat. You can get a cat or a dog, then you never have to drink alone. I guess drinking with dead people is a little a little aggressive. <laughs> you mean spirits when we say dead people, right? Not just cadavers propped against the wall while you're drinking. <laughs> I mean, if you have a cadaver that is not being not being one. searched for, you legally have a cadaver you want to drink with. I support you. <laughs> All right, that's uh, about going to wrap it up for this episode of the Booze and Spirits podcast. Um, tune in for our next episode when we will be talking camels. What kind of camels? All the camels? All the camels from the toe on north. Toe on up. Yep. Uh, be sure to check out our show notes for information about this episode. And uh, 
the recipe for Salty Bill's Link with Richard. Also, you can be sure to check us out on Apple, Google, Spotify Podcasts, and see us on YouTube. Please, 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 if you enjoy the show, leave us a review and a rating. You can also check us out on our website, boozeandspirits.com. Um, we are on the Instagram, at Booze and Spirits Podcast. Our YouTube channel is Booze Spirits, D-O-O-S, Spirits. So, you could want to let us put the O-O-Z-E, so whatever you could do, you can do that. And uh, please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Remember, do not end up our next ghost. You're wearing a shirt that says Year of Ghost. quietly as she promised to. <laughs> well, I was realizing your shirt says Year of Ghost. <laughs> it is a ghost. It's a Pokemon. So, so uh, with that, I'm Nick McDonald. My t-shirt is Gengar. Did you just say your t-shirt is Gaydar? Gengar is the name of Pokemon. <laughs> 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 I summon you, Gaydar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nick McDonald and my t-shirt is gay dark and it is going off hard <laughs> alright we're ending the episode goodbye <laughs>